everyone uh, good morning so today we are going to start the course uh, today we are here for uh, lecture 1 of renewable energy engineering solar wind and biomass energy systems among these three uh, major renewable energy systems i am going to handle solar and wind energy systems and uh, my colleague professor gaud would be handling uh, biomass energy systems mr mrinal and ms swarna uh, both are going to be teaching assistants for solar and wind energy systems and their mail id is given and if you have any course related queries you can write to me and you can take help from uh, teaching assistants as well as far as course objectives are concerned this course would enable the learner to understand the importance of solar energy and the basics of solar energy conversion techniques. The moment we say about solar energy conversion techniques, there are two types. One is direct method, the other one is indirect method. In the direct method, we will talk about solar thermal. There is a another conversion solar PV that we are not going to discuss about in this course and indirect method wind, biomass, water power etcetera would come, but we are restricting ourselves to wind and biomass energy system. So, directly it can be converted or the temperature difference created by solar energy can help us in this indirect method of conversion. Also, this course would enable the learner to apply the solar energy knowledge, whatever you gain out of this course may be useful for the development of sustainable systems in future. So, in short it would help you to understand the importance of solar energy and solar energy conversion techniques, it will also be useful for the development of any sustainable system in future. The course structure goes like this, the solar wind would be covered in 4 modules. The first week, first module have 3 lectures, one is on solar energy overview of thermal applications, second lecture would be on solar radiation third lecture will be on practice problems on how to calculate solar radiation parameters. The second module of second week includes non concentrating solar collectors, concentrating solar collectors and the practice problems on uh, how to design non concentrating or concentrating solar collectors. Third module of third week includes thermal energy storage systems, solar energy utilization methods. Fourth week of module 4 includes turbine terms types and theories of wind energy and characteristics of wind and power generation. In today's lecture of solar energy and overview of thermal applications, we would be discussing basic concepts of energy, types of energy, renewable and non-renewable energies, energy alternatives and current energy scenario, sun and earth relationship, formation of the atmosphere solar radiation at the earth's surface, air mass, instruments for the measurement of solar radiation and sunshine along with we will review some of the solar thermal applications. The first topic would be on basic concepts of energy. So, if you are already working in energy engineering or chemical engineering or mechanical engineering, so you are comfortable with these terminologies and the units of energy. However, since this course is common to all students who are willing to learn renewable energy engineering as well. So, we are going to review about the terms related to energy and their units. So, energy is defined as ability to do work. So, in ancient times the primitive man required energy in terms of food. So, after the discovery of fire he learned how to cook and eat. So, for that he required uh, wood and biomass other than fire. Then after that he started cultivation and then agriculture. 
So, there he required animals and missionaries to help him for the agricultural purpose. That is the way the energy requirement started increasing day by day and in ancient times, so the whole energy need uh, needs of mankind were served from solar energy only. Then after the invention of uh, internal combustion engines, then we started uh, using non-renewable energy sources as well. Here energy is nothing but ability to do work. So, then we will define work, work can be defined as transfer of energy. In physics we say that the work is done on object when you transfer energy to that object. It is not only when you transfer the energy to that object. So, because of transfer the object should move. So, work is defined as force into displacement and multiplied with cos theta. So, this theta is nothing but the angle between f and d. So, if both are in same direction then this would be 0. So, this is 1. So, work is defined as f into d that is force supply and the displacement. And then power the rate of energy use power is defined as work upon time. So, if you are working in PV solar PV then power is defined as power is voltage into current. So, voltage unit is volts, current unit is amperes, power is in watt. So, if you are working in solar thermal then energy is nothing but power into time a quantity of energy such as a watt second or kilowatt hour or calories or joules etcetera can be used as a unit of energy. 1 watt second is nothing but 1 joule. Then here in this course we are also going to discuss about thermal energy storage system. So, there this particular term would be used uh, frequently that is nothing but energy density. Energy density is the amount of energy stored in a given system or region of space per unit volume. So, the unit is joule per meter cube. So, if you are working on basic SI units, joule is defined as work done. Work done can be defined as Newton meter that is force into distance. Newton is nothing but kg meter per second square into meter. So, energy density is nothing but an amount of energy stored in a given system or region of space upon volume. Volume is in meter cube. So, then your unit would be kg meter power minus 1 second power minus 2 if you are working in basic SI units. So, this is the way the work power energy and energy density can be related. So, uh, SI unit of joule can be defined as the work or energy joule is unit of work or energy which is equivalent to work done by a force of 1 Newton when its point of application moves 1 meter in the direction of action of the force. That is what here we said force into distance. It is also equivalent to 1 3600th of watt hour. The commercial unit of energy may be you might have seen in electricity measurement at your home. So, that is in kilowatt hour. So, it is the energy supplied when 1 kilowatt power is used for 1 hour and this is the basic law of conservation of energy that is energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. It can only be transformed from one state to another state. So, this is the basis for first law of thermodynamics. Then we will review about laws of thermodynamics with which we need to define or design the energy systems. But I am here not going into deep just uh, to make you aware of uh, these concepts and to remind you. So, whatever uh, you learnt on uh, thermodynamics or uh, basic uh, science at school level. Uh, internal energy is nothing but a energy of molecular motion. Uh, heat is nothing but the energy which is flowing as a result of temperature difference 
and first law of thermodynamics it is nothing but a conservation of energy in any process energy can neither be created or not be destroyed and the change in objects or substance internal energy which is nothing but del u is the sum of mechanical work done on it and the heat flows into it right so uh, del u is nothing but q minus w so this is heat given to the system so this is uh, we take it as a positive quantity so this is work done by the system okay so that is uh, negative a sign we will give for work so del u is nothing but q minus w first time the researcher joule so he did a experiment and uh, came up with the relation between work and heat so he came up with uh, certain kind of uh, arrangement where insulated vessel is there so there uh, he kept one uh, stirrer and uh, he connected this into a pulley arrangement right and uh, connected with some weight right uh, so when the weight is uh, going down so this paddle wheel uh, arrangement which is connected with the pulley and the thread so it uh, rotates this uh, stirrer when it rotates automatically the fluid inside the vessel gets heated and temperature rises temperature rises so this drop in weight uh, we calculate as a drop in potential energy right so that uh, helps in work done on the system right uh, through the stirring and due to which the temperature rises so that is converted into heat energy so this is the relation he proposed first before that uh, heat was uh, identified as a calorific fluid so the first law of thermodynamics uh, came up with the relation between work and heat right and also it it said that the change in object substance internal energy is the sum of the mechanical work done by or on the system and heat flows into or out of the system and then second law of thermodynamics so we have here uh, two statements the one is the kelvin planck statement so it says that no other effect than the absorption of energy as heat from a single thermal reservoir and performs an equivalent amount of work so any uh, heat cannot be converted uh, 100 percentage into work so that is the basic concept of kelvin planck statement and then clausius statement so here this statement says that no effect other than transfer of heat from a low temperature body to a high temperature body we cannot extract heat from low temperature body to high temperature body and this is the third law of thermodynamics the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero when the temperature of the crystal is equal to absolute zero that is nothing but zero kelvin so what third law says is it precisely tells you that uh, you cannot get a absolute zero in a finite number of steps so that is the concept of third law of thermodynamics so at absolute zero there can't be any environmental parameter you can manipulate to change the entropy if t is zero then s is zero no matter what so that is the third law of thermodynamics apart from first and second and third law of thermodynamics there is uh, something called zeroth law of thermodynamics so it says that objects in contact with one another will share the heat energy until they reach thermal equilibrium so that is nothing but uh, zero law of thermodynamics it also states that if two objects are in thermal equilibrium with the third one then they are all in thermal equilibrium so that is nothing but zero law of thermodynamics so any heat transfer system or energy conversion devices will work uh, based on these uh, laws of thermodynamics that's what uh, here we are reminding us one more time so that we will be careful in doing uh, calculations and then types of energy the major types of energy are uh, potential energy and then the kinetic energy 
right. The potential energy is nothing but stored energy or energy of position and uh, kinetic energy is nothing but motion of waves, electrons, atoms, molecules, substance and objects. Under potential energy, there are various kinds chemical energy, mechanical energy and then nuclear energy, gravitational energy. So, what is chemical energy under potential energy? Energy stored in bonds of atoms and molecules. So, examples are batteries where you can store the electrical energy and biomass where you can uh, store the energy and then petroleum, natural gas and coal and fossil fuels store electromagnetic energy from the sun. And when combusted the original energy in the bonds of the reactants the, right that is what we told stored energy. So, when you combust these uh, fossil fuels what happens is that the energy which is stored in the bonds of the reactants will be released. So, that is equivalent to the heat released plus chemical energy of the newly formed compounds right. So, if you burn the coal you will also uh, get carbon dioxide as a byproduct right. So, this energy also equivalent to the stored energy. And then mechanical energy, energy stored in objects by tension, the example is compressed spring. When you apply the force you compress right, when the force is released energy is also released. So, energy stored in objects by tension is nothing but mechanical potential energy. Next one is nuclear energy. So, this is nothing but energy stored in the nucleus of atom. So, uh, this energy is nothing but the energy that holds the nucleus together. The large amounts of energy can be released when the nuclei are combined or split apart. So, when you combine this is called fusion. So, when you split it is called fission right. Fusion powers the star such as fusion of two hydrogen atoms makes a helium. So, this is the concept of sun that we will uh, discuss anyway right and fusion powers a nuclear bombs as well. So, these two are examples for nuclear energy under potential energy and then gravitational energy. So, energy stored in an object's height. So, this we call it as a mgh. So, where mg is nothing but weight of the weight of the object. So, h is nothing but the height right. So, the higher and heavier the object heavier is uh, weight is high or height is higher then you would get more gravitational energy stored. So, the gravity forces the water down through a hydroelectric turbine to produce electricity is nothing but an example for this gravitational energy. So, next we are going to discuss about the kinetic energy. So, under this thermal energy, radiant energy, electrical energy and motion energy comes. Thermal energy comes from the movement of atoms and molecules in substance. So, it increases when atoms and molecules move faster and collide with each other. The example is geothermal energy. So, what we get from the earth core and then the uh, second major kinetic energy is uh, radiant energy. So, that is due to electromagnetic energy that travels in the transverse waves. It includes visible uh, light, x-rays, gamma rays and radio waves. Example is an illuminating object or source such as sun or a lamp. So, these three are examples for radiant energy. However, as we said earlier, so this sun or electromagnetic waves of the sun can also be stored in fossil fuels. When you burn them, then you will get them as a chemical energy as well. So, this we have already discussed right conservation of energy. One form can be converted into another form. Then the next one is electrical energy, energy caused by moving electric charges called electrons. Uh, the natural uh, electrical energy is nothing but a lightning process. And then the motion energy, so energy stored uh, in the movement of objects, the faster they move more energy is stored right. So, that is the way it comes under kinetic energy. It takes energy to get an object moving and the energy is released when the object slows down. So, example is wind, uh, we will uh, discuss anyway in this course about that. So, this is basic certain types of energy, but if we want to discuss the types of energy in terms of its usage, then we will have two major category. One is non-renewable energy, another is uh, renewable energy. So, non-renewable energy are like what we have right now for our energy needs, the oil, coal, uh, nuclear and then natural gas. 
So, they cannot be used again and again, uh, but one day uh, they will be exhausted and likely to deplete with time. It has high carbon emission and hence not environment friendly. So, because when they burn, so they also produce uh, CO2. So, because of which they are not uh, environment friendly. It is present in limited quantities. And uh, in terms of environmentally safe, uh, it is said that electricity generation by burning some fossil fuel, a coal or gas or diesel, the norm is 1 kg of CO2 equivalent is generated per kilowatt hour of electricity. So, that is what we call these non-renewable energies as a, they are not a clean energy. The next one is renewable energy, uh, they can be harnessed without the release of harmful pollutants that is a major advantage and they are uh, essentially inexhaustible and it can be used again and again throughout the life. They are the energy resources which cannot be exhausted, it has low carbon emission and hence environment friendly. So, they are solar, wind, water, biomass and geothermal. So, in this course we are going to discuss about solar, wind and biomass, three major renewable energy sources. And then the quality and source of energy, based on that quality we can have two primary energy sources and secondary energy sources. The primary energy sources are they are directly mined or otherwise obtained from the environment. So, mined is um, coal, natural gas, petroleum and uranium. So, they are called non-renewable energy sources and if we get from the nature or environment, they are called renewable energy sources. As we said, biomass, hydropower, geothermal, solar, wind, tidal, everything comes under this category. Secondary energy resources are not occur in the nature or mind, but are derived from the primary energy sources that is converted, right. So, electrical energy from coal burning, we can convert this heat energy into electrical energy and hydrogen obtained by electrolysis of water. So, that also comes under secondary energy resources. So, now uh, pretty much we have uh, discussed about uh, the basics before going to discuss solar energy. So, we have uh, learnt what is the basic concepts of energy and then types of energy in terms of uh, the stored energy and the energy created due to movement and then we defined them based on their availability and the source of the energy. So, now uh, why we need to think about energy alternatives for whatever the energy available today for our uh, energy needs. So, most of our energy needs we are depending on uh, the fossil fuels. In fossil fuels oil provides 30 percentage of world's need for energy from commercial sources. So, any non-renewable energy as we said already, so it is not in, inexhaustible in nature. So, due to which there would be a uh, increase in production and there would be a peak production and there would be a declination period, right. So, for the oil the model says that 2015 was the uh, peak period after that the production capacity or production of oil would decrease, right. So, this is the major fuel for all our transportation systems in the present day. And uh, as far as natural gas is concerned, uh, no threat as of now, but the, its peak period would be sometime around 2025, that is 2025. And uh, for coal, it is little later, uh, probably 2050. So, because after a certain time, right, after uh, 2050, so we cannot depend solely on the fossil fuels, right, because all would be in the decline mode. And apart from uh, energy needs, these non-renewable energy sources are used for manufacturing of organic chemicals, right. So, in the decline mode, they may not be able to be used to manufacture organic chemicals because in the declination mode, probably we might be using only for uh, energy needs, right. So, the plants which are dependent on the uh, non-renewable energy source for manufacturing of organic chemicals would be affected. So, it is the right time for us to think about various energy alternatives uh, instead of these fossil fuels. So, the two major alternatives are uh, water power and nuclear power. In the water power, we can use it, uh, but the problem is the environmental concern in storing large amount of water. So, already in many parts of India, we are facing water scarcity. So, again that put the constraints uh, to use water power without any worry. 
So, then the next one is the nuclear power. So, here fission reactions in pressurized water or heavy water reactors we can create nuclear power using uranium 235 isotope. So, here uh, we have uh, resources for uranium 235, 234 and 238, but uh, their availability if we see uh, this is around 0 0.7. So, this is around uh, 0.3 and then uh, 0 0.3 percentage, 0 0.7 percentage and this is around uh, 99 percentage. But right now we have the technology to use uh, uranium 235, but still it can cater our energy needs. But if we have some alternative technology which uses or which converts uranium 238 as a fissile material, then uh, we might be in better position uh, to think about nuclear power as a alternative uh, energy source, right. So, after discussing or after getting to know these facts, so we can come up with certain better alternatives, so which are solar and nuclear and tar sands and oil shale, tidal, geothermal and hydrogen. So, uh, solar is obviously the better option and we will also discuss uh, the fact why it can be considered as a better alternative. But in nuclear already we discussed like you have a uranium 235, so that is bombarded with the neutrons and give the fission products, fission products plus fast neutrons plus energy, heat energy. So, we will use uh, some moderator to convert this neutrons into slow neutrons. And then uh, we again bombard this isotope, right. Uh, I am not getting into detail because uh, this is not of our interest, but I am telling like what further can be done, right. So, as we said, if we develop some other technology to use the major available resources of uh, uranium 238 or we can come up with better technology, then converting this particular fertile material into some other fissile material and that can be used to um, extract the energy. So, with these technologies we can think of this as a um, better alternative option and tar sands we can uh, produce the uh, synthetic petroleum. So, that we are not depend on the natural fossil fuel and oil shale also can be used to produce the petroleum. And tidal energy this comes again under water power and geothermal as we said we are getting energy from the earth core and hydrogen this can be done by electrolysis of water already we have uh, said that electrolysis of water. Again these two comes under water power and uh, this comes under the energy from the earth. So, these can be the uh, alternative energy or we need to come up with alternative technology to what are all the available technologies today, right. In that way we can uh, think of alternatives to available non-renewable energy resources today. So, in that the first and better option we thought about is the solar. So, earth receives uh, around 1.7 into 10 to the power of 18 watts of solar energy and it is a clean source and it is available in abundant in all parts of the world where people live, ok. So, this is major advantage, but disadvantage side the solar radiation flux uh, available rarely exceeds 1 kilowatt per meter square. So, total radiation over a day is at its best of 7 kilowatt hour per meter square. So, we would be uh, requiring large collecting areas for many thermal applications. And also the another disadvantage is its availability is depend on time, so due to day night cycle and also there would be seasonal changes due to earth's orbit around the sun. So, because of these two reasons we would also require the storage, ok. So, here we need to improve the solar collection, solar energy collection. 
So, here we need to think about storage as well. So, these two major requirements lead to large installation costs, right. So, in terms of availability, it is abundant, but how to collect and how to store when it is excess and that will be used when there is a scarcity is something that we need to think about. And uh, this can be used as a direct method as well as indirect method, direct method PV and thermal uh, and indirect method is wind and biomass. So, here we are not going to discuss about PV only thermal wind and biomass. So, current energy scenario in terms of solar energy. So, this is taken from uh, arena. So, this is international. renewable energy agency. You can check in this site. So, here uh, electricity generation we have taken as a major conversion and all country, all technology, all sub technology we have taken all the sub technologies are uh, here. So, this is the graph it came up with. So, here we are going to only highlight solar thermal and solar PV. Uh, solar PV it is uh, around 5,49,833 gigawatt hour. For solar thermal it is 12,200 uh, gigawatt hour. And we also have checked this with electrical generation in India uh, with the solar technology, sub technology both solar thermal and solar photovoltaic. Since we are not considering solar photovoltaic, so we came up with a number uh, in only for solar thermal. So, that is 4 gigawatt uh, hour in around 2010, it got increased to 360 gigawatt hour in 2018. So, this is in terms of electricity generation and in terms of installed capacity again in India in solar technology both sub technology and we have not come up with the numbers for solar photovoltaic obviously you can see here that is a major part. But since we are interested in solar thermal, we came up with numbers for solar thermal. So, 3 megawatt in around 2010 and uh, 229 megawatt in 2019. So, this is the current energy scenario in terms of uh, solar thermal for installed capacity as well as for electricity generation. And then before moving uh, into thermal applications, we will review few facts about earth and sun and their geometric relationship because uh, to get to know about solar radiation. So, we might be in need of certain uh, informations. So, the earth revolves around the sun in an elliptical shape once per year and it is almost round in shape and has a diameter of uh, approximately 1.27 into 10 to the power of 7 meter. It is inclined at an angle of 23.5 degree and rotates about its self axis. Right. So, the inner core of the earth is solid comprising of iron and nickel unlike the sun. So, sun it is uh, nothing but we call it as a helium right. So, fusion reaction of hydrogen atoms uh, into helium uh, anyway that we will uh, discuss. So, it is outer core of the earth constitutes of melted state of iron and nickel. So, this both comprise of the region core we call it as. So, inner core is solid and then outer core is uh, the melted state that is in liquid state. So, this is inner core. So, this is outer core right. Then there comes the earth's mantle. So, the outer core of uh, earth mantle comprises of solid rock. The outermost is crust that covers the mantle also constitutes a uh, solid cover right. So, earth mantle also you have in the mantle. So, you have two sections one is the lowermost and then uppermost ok. So, this uppermost with the crust both of them together called lithosphere ok. Then after that uh, above than that you will have the ocean and then land part. And then uh, nearly 70 percentage of earth is covered by water and remaining 30 percentage is land. 
average surface temperature of the earth is around 288 Kelvin and earth receives radiation of about 1.7 into 10 to the power of 18 watt. So, this uppermost mantle and crust forms the lithosphere, then after that after lithosphere there is a troposphere. Then after troposphere there is a stratosphere, then after that mesosphere, then thermosphere, then exosphere. So, that is outermost part of the earth. Okay. And then the sun uh, which is largest member of the solar system. So, they are intensely hot gaseous matter, the diameter is 1.36 into 10 to the power of 9 meter, the average distance of the sun from the earth is around 1.496 into 10 to the power of 11 meter. The sun rotates its own axis approximately once in 4 weeks, so we call it as 27 or 28 days. So, density at its center is around 10 to the power of 5 uh, kilograms per meter cube greater than. So, certain NASA models uh, predicts it as 1.622 into 10 to the power of 5 kg per meter cube and pressure at its center is around over uh, 1 billion atmosphere and uh, uh, again the model predicts it as 2.477 into 10 to the power of 11 bar. The central core temperature is around uh, 8 to 40 into 10 to the power of 6 Kelvin. So, the model predicts it as 1.571 into 10 to the power of 7 Kelvin due to several fusion reactions. 90 percentage of sun's energy is generated in a spherical region having radius of 0.23 times the sun's radius. The black body temperature is 5777 Kelvin due to continuous fusion reaction. Energy radiation is around 3.8 into 10 to the power of 26 watts. So, this is diameter of the sun, diameter of the earth and then their distance. So, here uh, we have uh, the sun and uh, earth's rotation. So, how we get uh, two solstices, one in December and another in June and then two equinox days, one in March and another is in uh, September. Uh, winter uh, solstice is the day uh, which is the shortest day of the year and at the summer solstice it is the year's longest day. Equinox is the time when the sun crosses the plane of earth's equator making night and day of approximately equal length all over the earth. So, that is two equinox we get on March and uh, September. So, where your declination angle of the sun uh, becomes 0, 0 degree, 0 degree. And in June uh, solstice, uh, what you get is declination angle is 23.5 degree, and in December, what you get is minus 23.5 degree. So, this is this particular figure is taken at uh, timeanddate.com. So, here uh, you can see the March equinox and September equinox, uh, whatever we told uh, here. So, where your declination angle is 0 right and uh, this is the uh, earth's axis is always tilted at an angle of about 23.45 degrees and uh, these two are uh, December and uh, June uh, solstice like this is 23.45. So, if you see so this is December solstice. So, here your declination angle is minus 23.45. 4, 5 degree. So, here this December to March you would get 89 days and this equinox to this solstice you will get 89.8 days and this side uh, from March equinox to uh, June uh, solstice you will get 92.8 days and from June solstice to September equinox you would get 93.6 days. Then the source of solar energy as we discussed already around uh, 0 0.23 r this is nothing but a inner core of the uh, sun right. So, 90 percentage of the energy is produced over here. So, from the center so this distance of uh, the core distance is uh, around 1.39 into 10 to the power of 
0.5 kilometer. So, 90 percentage of the energy is produced here. So, that we are going to see how the energy generated in the region is due to several fusion reactions. In fusion, two hydrogen molecules combine to form one helium nucleus at approximately 10 to the power of 7 Kelvin temperature. The mass of uh, helium nucleus is less than that of the four protons, which is fusioned to give helium. And this mass having been lost in the reaction is converted into energy uh, by the relation given by uh, Einstein m, uh, E equal to m c square. So, this is that particular reaction when two hydrogen atoms are being fusioned to get helium. So, this is the uh, way it is uh, predicted the what is happening inside the sun. Uh, the produced energy is transferred to the outer surface of the sun by convection. Uh, the second layer is nothing but radiation and then by convection. The solar energy is radiated into space which is calculated as epsilon sigma t to the power of 4. So, epsilon is nothing but emissivity of the surface, uh, sigma is nothing but Stephen Boltzmann constant which is 5.67 into 10 to the power of minus 8 watt per meter squared Kelvin power 4. So, coming back to here the next zone is nothing but a uh, radiation zone. So, here almost 1,70,000 uh, years to radiate through this layer of the sun. So, this radiation zone to cross, so it takes almost 1,70,000 years and uh, this distance from the core of the sun is about 5.1 into 10 to the power of 5 kilometer. The temperature is around 8.4 into 10 to the power of 6 Kelvin and the density is about uh, 10 to the power of 5 kilograms per meter cube. So, this spreads over almost 0.7 of total radius of the sun. The outermost region is nothing but a convective zone. So, in this um, zone energy continues to move toward the surface through the convection currents of heated and cold gas. This uh, length is around uh, 6.9 into 10 to the power of 5 kilometer. The temperature is about 1.3 into 10 to the power of 5 Kelvin and uh, density is about 10 to the power of 5 kilograms per meter cube. Then after this, so this constitutes a sun, uh, inner core region and then radiative region and then convective region. Then after that we will have this photosphere, chromosphere, transition region and corona. Uh, in the photosphere, it reaches from the surface visible at the center of the solar disk. So, that is this particular surface. So, to about 400 kilometer it spreads over. The temperature in this region is between about uh, 6500 Kelvin at the bottom to 4000 Kelvin at the top. So, that means, so from this surface when it spreads over outer region, so the temperature is decreased and this is covered by granulation. The next layer is chromosphere. So, it is a layer in the sun between uh, 400 to uh, 2100 kilometer above the solar surface. The temperature in the chromosphere varies between uh, about 4000 Kelvin at the bottom to 8000 Kelvin at the top. So, that means inner part is lesser temperature, outer part is higher temperature. So, that means when, when it spreads over uh, the outer surface, its temperature is increasing. So, the transition region is very narrow region uh, between chromosphere and corona where the temperature rises abruptly from uh, 8000 Kelvin to uh, 5 lakh Kelvin. So, the outermost layer of the sun uh, starting at about uh, 2100 kilometer uh, above the solar surface, the temperature in the corona layer is uh, 5 lakh Kelvin or more up to few million Kelvin. The corona uh, cannot be seen with the naked eye except during total uh, solar eclipse or with the help of that uh, corona graph. The corona does not have an upper limit, so it, it spreads over. So, then uh, the formation of the atmosphere, so this is nothing but our sun. So, the sun and this is nothing but earth surface, so this we call it as a, the lower surface of the earth, we call it as a terrestrial region. The upper limit of this atmosphere is nothing but extraterrestrial region, right. Uh, so, now here the earth's coast and uh, uppermost mantle forms the lithosphere, this we already discussed. So, the various gases stored inside the earth might have escaped 1 million years back into atmosphere in the form of greenhouse gases. 
So, the ozone uh, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and water vapor everything forms together as a greenhouse gases. So, they move towards the sun and become stable between sun and earth. So, this region is called atmosphere right where this uh, gases are there between sun and earth which is porous in nature it also referred as the earth's atmosphere due to its being nearer to the earth because it is nearer to earth it is called as earth's atmosphere. So, this is the view of atmosphere between earth and uh, sun and earth. So, this is nothing but porous atmosphere we, where we have uh, GHG greenhouse gases. So, these are the re reason for the sun's radiation to get diffuse and reaches the earth and the radiation which are not absorbed or scattered through these gases directly reaches the earth that we call it as a beam radiation. Uh, then certain unique properties of atmosphere, it atmosphere transmits the short wavelength radiation which is about 0 0.23 to 2.26 uh, micrometer coming from the sun and it behaves opaque or uh, not transparent for uh, long wave radiation which is uh, greater than uh, 2.26 micrometer. Solar radiation coming from the sun is reflected back to the space from the earth of approximately 4 percentage and its atmosphere is uh, about 26 percentage. The amount of radiation reflected back we call it as albedo. The amount of albedo depends on types of soil, plantation cover over the earth surface and cloud distribution. So, here uh, if we see the various uh, radiation and their wavelength is given. So, for thermal radiation is it is about 0 0.1 to 100 micrometer, but solar so this is what we are um, interested in 0 0.1 to 3 micrometer, visible range comes uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 micrometer and in that ultraviolet range also comes um, I mean this solar radiation both visible range that is totally into it and ultraviolet spans from 0 0.4 to 10 to the power of minus 2 uh, micrometer. So, this also some part comes in uh, solar radiation and infrared spans between 0 0.7 to 1000 micrometer. So, this also comes here in the solar radiation and uh, if the object has 0 albedo, so that is nothing but a black color object it can absorb 100 percentage of the radiation as it receives and white color objects are um, considered as a uh, higher albedo objects. So, they are the perfect reflectors. So, this is solar radiation at the earth surface. So, if we consider this is the upper limit of the upper limit of the atmosphere and this is earth right. So, we get the solar radiation as we said already. So, the beam radiation reaches directly right. Sometimes it gets absorbed as well, this is absorbed. This is absorbed radiation and there may be a scattering here, scattering. So, in that way the diffusive radiation also reaches. So, this is diffusive radiation. Or we call it as a scattered radiation. And there may be radiation which is ground reflection due to ground lift reflection as well ok and uh, some of the radiation goes back to space scattered radiation reflected back to space. Okay. So, this is overall picture of solar radiation at the earth surface. So, as we said the solar energy when it reaches the earth there may be a attenuation 
So, that is due to absorption as we said here right. So, this happens either by ozone or water vapor again they are coming under uh, greenhouse gases only and to the lesser extent uh, the other uh, greenhouse gases and particulate matters. The, those are CO, CO2, NO2, O2 and CH4 right and then the scattering. So, one is by absorption, the second is by scattering. So, the scattering happens due to gaseous molecules again. particulate matters so these are um, distributed in all directions so in that way we may not expect it is uniform from all directions so we call it as a anisotropic but certain models uh, considered them as a isotropic in nature as well. And uh, this distributed uh, can be uh, reached, can reach earth's atmosphere or uh, they can go back to space as well, back into space as well. So, uh, the beam radiation that we have just uh, seen the solar radiation that does not get absorbed or scattered. So, but reaches the ground directly from the sun it produces shadow when interrupted by an opaque object. The diffusive radiation is the one the solar radiation received after its direction has uh, been changed by reflection and scattering in the atmosphere. Uh, usually we follow certain the terminologies uh, irradiance which is the rate of radiant energy falling on a surface per unit area of the surface that is watt per meter squared symbol is G and irradiation is the incident energy per unit area on the surface that is joule per meter squared. So, here joule per second meter squared. So, if we take instant energy that is joule per meter squared obtained by integrating a irradiance over a specified time interval. We can do it by day or we can do it uh, per hour and the second if you are doing that is uh, instant. Then uh, specifically for solar irradiance this is called insulation right. So, if you integrate it over a day or our this is called insulation. So, we use the symbol H for a day and I for a insulation for an hour right. So, it can be uh, given as watt per meter square as a flux right which is nothing but radiant energy falling on a surface per unit area or we can give them in terms of joules per meter square day or hour right instead of joule per second meter square. So, the measurement of some of the direct and diffusive uh, radiation uh, is called the global solar irradiance. So, this is beam and this is scattered diffusive radiation, this is albedo either it can reach earth surface or it can go back to uh, space as well. So, this is the important term DNI in solar radiation at the earth surface. The amount of solar radiation coming directly from the sun which is called as beam radiation reaching a flat surface at the earth surface oriented normally to the sun's position throughout the day that is called direct normal irradiance. The portions of the visible radiation reaching the top of the atmosphere can be scattered back to uh, space or reflected towards the earth surface by the presence of cloud particles and aerosols. So, in addition air molecules can absorb some of the radiation in the visible channels as well. So, either scattered or absorbed. So, this portion that is reflected by clouds or atmospheric aerosols we call them as diffusive radiation 
on a flat surface oriented horizontally. So, that is what it is called a diffuse horizontal irradiance. Then global horizontal irradiance is nothing but total radiation falling on a flat surface horizontal to the earth surface that is global horizontal irradiance is nothing but beam radiation assuming it is not obscured by cloud and diffuse radiation from the clouds and sky. So, this is uh, DNI which is nothing but direct normal irradiance and diffuse horizontal irradiance and then global horizontal irradiance proper definitions. Then the next one is uh, nothing but air mass. So, when the radiation passes through the atmosphere consisting of greenhouse gases, there is a atmosphere attenuation happens. The amount of attenuation is governed by the air mass. So, this uh, attenuation is nothing but the decrease in energy. right? So, the ratio between the paths travelled by the solar radiation through the atmosphere to the mass travelled by the solar radiation if the sun is at its zenith. right? So, the when sun is at uh, zenith then the position is A and C. When the path travelled by the solar radiation through the atmosphere to the mass travelled by the solar radiation if the sun is at its uh, zenith. So, A C is sun is at zenith, A B is nothing but the path travelled. right? So, uh, path length traversed in the atmosphere that is A B and vertical depth of the atmosphere is A C. So, if we take uh, cos of the angle, right? so that is nothing but H naught upon M naught. So, if we want to calculate m naught. So, this distance is a b is m naught, a c is h naught. So, if we want to calculate m naught upon h naught that is 1 by cos theta z that is secant uh, theta z for all theta z less than or equal to 0. At noon uh, we will have uh, theta z as 0, there your air mass is 1. For theta z is 60 then uh, we will get air mass is 2 and if for m equal to 0 for outside the earth surface. And here uh, if we see the another expression given by Kasten, so which has certain constants and zenith angle as well. The variation of the air mass with the time of the day for the latitude of New Delhi for different number of days of the year is uh, given here. right? So, here uh, if we see the December 21st, so this particular figure, so your air mass is very much high. Right. So, it is observed that sunshine hours are shorter and the air mass higher for the month of December on 21st compared to other days. So, December uh, 21st we will get uh, lesser sunshine hours. So, obviously, air mass is higher. So, then followed by June and if we see uh, the March time you will attain time of the day around 12 noon the air mass is 1. So, you will get less air mass. Then next one is instrument for measurement of solar radiation and sunshine. So, we will get the quantum of energy that can be derived from a particular uh, location in terms of three quantities. One is global or diffusive radiation and then beam radiation or direct radiation and hours of sunshine over the day. So, these three quantities we can measure. And what are all the uh, equipments used for this measurement? One is pyranometer, the second one is pyreliometer and then uh, sunshine recorders. We are going to discuss each one of them in uh, subsequent slides. The first one is pyranometer, we can call it as a solarimeter. So, this is uh, used to measure the solar irradiance in the desired location and solar radiation flux density. So, this solar uh, spectrum almost extends between 300 to 2800 uh, nanometer. So, this World Meteorological Organization WMO uh, has adopted this instrument which is standardized with respect to uh, ISO 9060 standard and pyranometers are calibrated based on the world uh, radiometric reference which is maintained by World Radiation Center Davos, Switzerland. So, in that way it is calibrated properly to measure the solar irradiance data. And then pyranometer which measures the either global or diffusive radiation. Global uh, radiation we can directly measure, diffusive means then we need to do certain arrangements 
to stop the beam radiation. So, which falls on the horizontal surface over a hemispherical field of view. So, here we have these three major parts one is horizontal circular disc of 25 millimeter diameter coated with the special black lacquer having high absorptivity of solar wavelength. And then there is a disc which is placed on a larger diameter guard plate and two concentratic hemispheres which are made of optical glass having good transmission and protects the uh, disc surface from weather. So, here if you see these are those the glass domes. So, this is nothing but black surface and this is nothing but a god plate. The temperature increases until the radiation equals the uh, rate of heat loss by convection and conduction and radiation and hot junctions of the thermophile material um, which are attached to one end is attached to black surface another end which is cold junction which is located under the god plate. So, EMF generator of about uh, 0 to 10 millivolt is recorded. So, it is read recorded and integrated over the time if you want to have it for a day or for an hour. So, this is uh, the particular arrangements. So, here we have leveling screw and platforms to uh, keep it in particular position uh, against the sun's radiation. The sensor uh, thermophile glass doom and occulting disc. The sensor consisting of thermocouples connected in series provided with a black coating for absorbing all solar radiation. It exhibits near perfect cosine response which is nothing but a variation of pyranometers calibration with theta. Theta is nothing but angle of incidence and a flat spectrum that covers 300 to 50,000 nanometer that is solar spectrum. It is capable of producing potential that is relative to the temperature gradient. It is nothing here we have black surface. So, which absorbs the radiation. So, the thermophile material is connected one end is um, here in the black surface another end is in the god plate. It is considered as a cold junction and then there is a glass dome which is this one because we are considering here the total radiation right total solar radiation, but this dome restricts the spectral response from 300 to 2800 nanometer from a field view of 180 degree and its function is not only this, this hemispherical glass dome also shields the thermophile from wind, rain and uh, other environmental factors. But here we said that we will measure the global radiation using uh, this particular pyranometer. If we want to measure only diffusive radiation then we use occulting disc. So, this is used to measure the diffusive radiation and it blocks the beam radiation from the surface. So, uh, here the conversion is whatever the temperature difference created between the clear surface which is guard plate and the dark surface is converted into potential difference um, right. So, then uh, it is measured as a EMF. And the voltage produced by thermophile can be measured using potentiometer. The radiation data needs to be integrated by means of electronic integrator if you want to have particular time period. And very small temperature coefficient, temperature coefficient is nothing but relative change of physical property associated with the change in temperature that is EMF. And then it is calibrated to ISO standards already we have told this and performance index and performance ratio is high for this particular equipment. And the we can get integrated measurements over total available short wave solar radiation under all conditions. Apart from predicting the diffusive or global radiation this can be used for some other applications. One is establishment of greenhouse locations. We have already uh, discussed the relation between solar radiation and uh, GHG and then designing photovoltaic system to get the uh, radiation data and meteorological and climatical uh, studies and measurement of solar intensity data. The next one is pyreliometer. So, here we have two magnanine strips. Each strip is connected with the uh, thermocouple and a electric heater. So, for measuring radiation uh, one strip is shaded and heated by an electrical current passing through it. One is electrical current, other one is uh, getting solar radiation directly. The roles of the strips are interchanged for second set of observation to nullify any uh, effect of unavoidable minor differences there or not. And then when the temperature of both strips are same, the electrical uh, energy used in the 
heating first strip will be equivalent to solar energy absorbed by the second strip. So, that is the um, basic working principle we have two strips of magnet material. So, one is connected to the electric heater another is with the uh, solar radiation. So, when the temperature is uh, same for both the how much electrical energy we applied to the uh, one strip that is equivalent to solar radiation which is fallen on the second strip that is the working principle based on which pyreliometer works. So, then uh, the second strip is obtained by dividing the electrical energy with the product of strip area and its absorptivity. So, uh, here it measures beam radiation falling on the surface normal to the sun's rays. Here the black surface plate right the black body is uh, kept in the back side of the collimating tube which is aligned with the directions of sun rays because it is going to measure only beam radiation with the help of two axis uh, tracking system and alignment integrator. So, it is always ensured that it is aligned with the direction of the sun rays. So, this is protective lens and this is the collimating tube or halo tube the black body is kept here and this is the thermocouple module one is kept in black body another is in with the clear surface. So, this is the uh, axis system tracking tracking system. So, with which uh, we can measure the beam radiation. The application is again it is um, used for meteorological and climatic observations and material testing research and then assessment of efficiency of solar collectors and photovoltaic devices. Then uh, sunshine recorder used to measure the duration of the day when there was a bright sunshine give beam radiation and its construction is a transparent glass pier uh, mounted on a heavy uh, base and then one bowl which is provided below the glass pier and groove is provided to insert the paper. So, here it is right. So, this is the sphere and then the bowl below the glass pier and then groove is provided to insert the paper. So, this is this is that particular uh, space where your paper is kept and then uh, working is the glass concentrate the solar radiation and paper receive the solar radiation on it and paper give burn mark when the sunshine is present. So, for winter we have small cards small length cards and equinox in the medium sized and summer one we have long cards this is sunshine recorder cards. So, those were kept here in this place and this is an instrument for measuring duration of bright sunshine hours in uh, sunshine in hours it consists of glass pier that we already said and uh, which is in a section of spherical brass bowl which grooves to hold the recorder cards. So, that is this arrangement and the spear burns the trace on the cord after being exposed to the sun. The length of the trace is nothing but the direct measurement of duration of uh, bright sunshine hours and a long curved uh, cord for summer as we said right long curved cord for summer and short one for winter and then uh, stride cards for equinox days. And then thermal applications that we will discuss in tomorrow's class and then uh, continue to go about the solar radiation. And these are all the uh, references and uh, reading materials we would be using for this particular lecture as well as the lecture number 2 solar radiation. Thank you.